Today we'll talk about transcription, um, how to do the transcription based on your recording. We have already talked about this earlier, so, uh, so we had a detailed handout. It's on a PowerPoint, you'll find it, find it on Blackboard, and it's, it, it, it explains the notations, the conventions for doing a transcription. There are many different conventions. What we are using in this class is, you know, you just basically decide that, okay, let's use this. And what we are, we are using is something that is widely used in discourse analysis, and it's, um, it's uh, the transcription uh, approach that was, um, that was made, made um, famous, so to say, uh, by Deborah Tannen because she started using that and of course um, she uh, is a well-known discourse analyst, sociolinguist and, and so on. So, uh, so people have picked up that quite often, her, her system. It's not that different, but just, just so that you know, when you read uh, somebody else's transcription, a sample of somebody else's transcription, there is some variation. Some people use a little bit different, different conventions. But, but uh, for this particular assignment that is coming up, the transcription assignment, um, let's use this one, and you, find, uh, you will find it there on on Blackboard. And uh, for the transcription assignment, the first thing to do is something to transcribe, to acquire something to transcribe. And today we'll talk about um, how, to, how to acquire that recording. We already actually talked about it, so that you should uh, record 30 minutes, uh, but uh, don't do the recording uh, where you have like a dozen people uh, in a party, uh, a, a loud place, um, a bar, a party where there's background music on. So try to eliminate those kinds of situations so the task is going to be easier for you. In, uh, in all natural conversations there will be overlapping speech and you will be marking all those little details so it's very difficult to hear overlapping speech what two people are talking at the same time when there's also something else going on like music so if you want to have music have it like far away and, and low and explain to the people what you're doing that you're doing this for for a class assignment uh, and uh, and ask for whether it's okay to do it. You can also um, to record them. And you can then also, when you have done the recording, um, the half hour, you can then say, um, or you should say, if, 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 there's, if, the, if the participants feel that there's something that they don't want to be go into the transcript or something that they would prefer you to erase, so go ahead and do it. So we, we, we will do this uh, ethically. So uh, for the transcription assignment, uh, it, you, will, you will also write a little analysis of this. But even for the transcription assignment, because I will be reading your transcripts and uh, you will you will send those, and you will only transcribe one minute. So send that one minute to me as a as a voice file. You can do it with your phone. I think it should be relatively easy. And uh, and uh, uh, don't record. Don't record more. I mean, record um, um, thirty minutes, but then choose only that one minute and send only that one minute because otherwise it's going to be a huge file. The system is going to choke up. So one minute it can handle quite easily from all of you. <laughs> and um, and, uh, and before you do the transcription, it's very helpful for me in order to understand what is going on to give a short description uh, of the speech situation so that you would indicate these features. Who participated? What were the relationships between the participants? What is the reason for the gathering? Where did the conversation happen? What was the setting like? And what was the topic of the conversation? So, yes? 
you will transcribe a. Can you transcribe a, a, a phone call? Yes, you can. Yes, a phone call. Of course, that's an excellent, excellent question. You can transcribe a phone call as well. Just let the person know that I'm going to be transcribing. I'm going to be using this for my school assignment. Yes. Uh, so does it have to be exactly a minute, or can it be like 58 seconds, or a It can be, it can be. Uh, it, try to keep it close to a minute, but if, if it's a little bit under, if it's a few seconds over, that's fine. Okay. It's absolutely fine. Because sometimes you need a little bit more than a, more than a minute in order, because you will be writing that little analysis uh, about it. So for the analysis, sometimes you might need to finish like a little exchange, like if it's an adjacent, adjacency pair, which we have been talking about, then it's it's especially important to include those par parts of that. So, uh, good questions. Phone conversations are okay. It doesn't have to be exactly 60 seconds. So that's just kind of like a guideline. And uh, indicating these things, you notice that uh, this is not particularly what is going on in conversation analysis. We talked about those three different approaches to, uh, to uh, conversation analysis, that you know, everything, everything you're looking at is just in the text, so you don't tell anything about who is whose friend and so on. But, uh, but we will be doing more what we could uh, characterize as discourse analysis. Uh, we will still be quite accurate, um, and especially accurate about pauses, overlaps, and latchings. We talked about those latchings, like you know, somebody's talking and then there's no audible pause between the next person's turn. Um, so we will be marking all those. You'll be marking if somebody says a word louder. So you would be doing that in caps and, uh, and just look at all the transcription conventions that we talked about earlier. So this description of the setting, it doesn't need to be more than just a couple of sentences. And, um, and this whole thing is going to be 10 points, so I've just kind of indicated here that you will, how, how the grade uh, is going to be determined, um, the evaluation. So uh, you get one point for just you know, explaining what the situation is, address all these issues bulleted here, and then a detailed transcription. And you have those separate instructions and the transcription itself, it's going to be, um, I want to say, a page, a page and a little bit over the second page. So it's not long. But this is what I want to really underscore. If you haven't done your recording yet, uh, try to get it done as, as soon as possible. The transcription assignment is due on the 13th. So, um, so from somebody who has done a lot of transcription, uh, I promise you it will take a lot, a lot of time to do one minute. You would think, oh, it's just one minute, but it will, when you do a detailed transcription, it takes, uh, it takes uh, quite a bit of time to get it, get it polished. To, you have to listen to it. First, you know, you have to have the recording, then choose something that is to an extent interesting so that you can then write that little analysis about it. It doesn't have to be earth shattering, we're just practicing. But, um, but uh, leave yourselves enough time to do the transcription because I'm going to listen to it and I will. I will mark it for accuracy. So the the practice we, practice uh, goal of the practice here is to do an accurate transcription, so that uh, so that you will be kind of like trained for doing it. Okay, and uh, of course this is um, this is different from like you know. There are people who, are, who have professions as legal transcribers, medical transcribers, and so on. And, uh, and they have to be accurate too, but they don't have to mark all the overlapping speech, uh, speeches and, and the, the, the measure the, 
the length of the pauses and so on, but I want you to also pay attention to the pauses because they're interesting. Sometimes the pause is just there because a person is looking for a word. Uh, sometimes the pause is there because a person doesn't know how to reply to something that happened earlier. And, uh, it, and they tell something about the situation. So, um, so just mark everything very, very accurately. I will listen to it and I will compare your recording to your transcription and that's worth up to seven points. Um, and then, uh, okay, uh, skip the paragraph long analyses, um, half a page. Um, that will be a separate, well, actually, actually what I would like you to do is, yes, I, um, take it back. So write a, a, a paragraph long, uh, or half a page, not, not any longer, analysis of what you found was interesting. I will give you feedback about that because then you will be writing that little one page analysis. So this is kind of like a pre-analysis for your analysis, but you'll get my feedback on it. Is, do you have questions about this? Okay? All right? The analysis is the, no, it's the same, same analysis. So, was that the question? That the, the, this is like a little practice analysis, right? I forget, do, do you have the um, syllabus with you so I could refer to when the, when the um, transcript is due? Probably that's my syllabus at all. On the 20th? Okay, yes, oh, here it is. So, um, yeah, 20th, two to three page analysis of your transcription due. So when you do this, uh, this transcription assignment, just jot down something that you find interesting. And I might give you some feedback that that might also be interesting for your analysis. So, uh, so these are like two separate assignments. Uh, this is the transcription that is due on the 13th and it includes that little paragraph where you kind of like think through what you could be saying about it. And then you write the two to three page analysis of the transcription um, by the 20th. So by that time you will have my feedback about you know what you what you are uh, so that's, that is going on there, and I might, if I see something else that is important, then I'll say, you might also want to be looking at that, or this is great, that's a, that's a great observation or something. So you'll get some preliminary feedback on it. Okay, and altogether this is 10%, and then the, 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 um, uh, the analysis that you will be writing then is uh, another 10%. So altogether, this is actually 20% of your grade. And uh, the reason why it's, it comes up to 20% of the grade is that this is something that is very often, it's kind of like an eye-opener, that this is actually what happens in a natural conversation, that people do all these things that, that we do not pay attention to unless we have to, and now you quote unquote have to or get to if you are a positive thing. You get to do it. <laughs> All right. Um, so last time we talked about uh, we talked about uh, the episodes in uh, Finnish and in Finnish Finnish uh, business telephone conversations and English Finnish uh, telephone conversations because if you if you bring two cultures together something might happen and we did not uh, do we just looked at the uh, like preliminarily uh, we looked at what the what the episodes in a business telephone conversation are and uh, the episodes are opening non-topical which uh, tends to happen in, in the American uh, 
American, uh, we looked at that little American exchange. It's a very, very brief, non-topical. So how, hi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, how are you? And then immediately to business. And there are cross-cultural differences in, in the, the organization of the um, discourse here. So I'm, I'm showing this to you just as an example of what kinds of things we might find in perfectly normal, regular, naturally occurring conversations. Then there's the close, but it also depends how it, how it goes. So here's a, here's a summary, because those were kind of like convoluted details, but here um, where, where I analyzed uh, several Finnish, Finnish, and English, Finnish business conversations. But uh, here's, the, here's the summary of about the, the episode structure of business telephone conversations. There are uh, obligatory episodes, and then there are optional episodes or sub-episodes that are in parentheses. So what is, ob what is uh, obligatory? In a business telephone conversation, as we can imagine, just you know, thinking using common sense, you have to have an opening, and then you have to have the business. So that's the point, and then you have to have the close. So, bye. Nice talking to you. Let's get this done, or, or whatever uh, people decide to say there at the close. But when we look at the um, these these episodes, these main episodes, opening business and close, we will find that uh, there are also these sub-episodes, poss possible sub-episodes. -epi Let's look at the opening first. Uh, there is uh, typically an introduction, but that's optional, because sometimes business people's co phone conversations are connected by their secretaries. So, uh, so the secretary says, Mr. Such and Such is calling your Mrs. Such and Such, and uh, and then people already know. And of course, you know, today we have uh, caller IDs and so on. One of your explorations asks you to think about how the fact that we have caller ID. Um, if people still have landlines, do you know anybody who still has a landline phone? Yeah. Um, and, you know, people don't use the landline phones usually today so much because there's a lot of solicitation calls coming to the landlines. And, of course, they come to the, uh, to the cellular phones too. But, uh, but anyway, so how does, for instance, one of the, the explorations asks you to think about how does uh, the fact that we, can, we already see identify who the speaker is. How does, how, how does that change the dynam dynamics? Okay, so back to the business telephone conversations. And this was done at the time when people actually called, you know, from a, a company landline to another company landline. So, uh, so the only obligatory uh, part of the opening is some kind of a greeting. Uh, if there's no introduction, hi, hi, I am, I am. This is my name. This is my name, and uh, there can be a limited answer to how are you. So uh, if how are you is the greeting, like in the American conversations often, then it has a limited answer. Uh, if it and and then that is part of the opening. However, in some cultures, like we were looking at the Finnish conversation, we'll look at it in more detail. There is this non-topical episode which is almost obligatory in the Finnish conversation. So that's why I have that X under, X under the Finnish uh, conversation, but in parentheses, because it does not necessarily have to be there, but it tends to be there. So we are talking about, when we talk about the organization of discourse, it's not like, you know, and we've, we've underscored that it has rules, but the rules are kind of like bendable sometimes that you cannot absolutely predict that there will be a non-topical in a particular culture, in a particular genre of conversation, uh, telephone conversations. Uh, that non-topical, if it is there in the Finnish conversations, it's, um, it's, it's, 
typically an extended answer to how are you. So how are you is part of the opening, and then if there's a long answer to how are you, then that is part of the non-topical, which in certain cultures uh, tends to be needed before you can tackle the business, the serious thing of the conversation. You have to kind of like, I don't know, soften the ground in a way, um, make it more amenable to tackle the business, which sometimes can be controversial or something that you know you don't really know if the other person is going to be agreeing or whatever. Something there may be a complaint that uh, the other person needs to take care of, or you are returning a, a call about a complaint that you heard about, and so on. So uh, the extended answer to how are you is meant to kind of like lighten up the atmosphere. Sometimes it can be a, 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 a more direct lightening, like a, like a little joke, a um, little benevolent joke of what have you. So uh, those would be the non-topicals, and they are absent from the American business conversations. Now, again, I emphasize, that's the tendency, because we can generalize to every single conversation. That's not, that's not what this is about. It's to find these general patterns that tend, tend to happen, and that way we can understand better what's going on. Now, uh, the business is the obligatory part. You can see there's an X under both Finnish and under English, and that includes always the business in its in initiation. Uh, now, I am calling about this and that. And then there may be these side sequences. Uh, discourse uh, analysts and conversation analysts have identified that sometimes, you know, we're, we're talking about something, but then there's some kind of a side sequence that it's a little bit off the topic. It's off of uh, not, not addressing the exact topic, the central topic, but it's there. And those side sequences, they very often, they also function as lightenings so that... Um, so that they kind of, you know, soften the atmosphere. And then we have to have the close. Close uh, must have a close initi initiation. Uh, what do you usually say when, you're, when you've been talking with a friend for half an hour on your cell and then you really need to go? What do you, what do you say? I gotta go. Gotta go. Oh, I gotta go. Yes. Anything else? I yeah. Or we say, oh, it was nice talking with you. Um, we may recapit recapitulate something like, oh, happy birthday again. If you call someone to wish them happy birthday, you may say, oh, have a wonderful birthday. It was good talking with you. And then, only then, is it possible to say bye <laughs> and, and hang up, actually. So we have these rituals that we go through. Now, uh, the, the close initiation can, can be, as I said, it can be preceded by a recapitulation, and that sort of like leads to the fall, a close in initiation. And then there can also be a pre-close, like some kind of a lightning. Oh, we got that out of the way. Um, oh, that needs to go to the, to the file X or whatever. So some kind of a mild, not really a ha ha joke, but but something like that. So there are similarities between the Finnish and the I English um, conversations, and there are slight differences. The fact that there are slight differences uh, may be a bigger thing than just oh, it's just a slight difference. It may lead to interesting consequences, and here I have uh, I have done a, a relatively broad transcription here, so I'm going to read it from this one because it's easier to follow, and then I have a more uh, detailed transcription which we will be looking at because that you can look at as an example. It's not that this is a perfect transcription, <clears throat> but it gives you an idea of what kinds of things to put into the transcription. So we have NS, which is native speaker of English, an American businessman, and NNS, which stands for 
non-native speakers. So N, S, and N, N, S. Native speaker of American English. And um, non-native speaker. And his first language would be Finnish. <coughs> So, because that was my data base. So the, the Americans, and I'll just refer to these as American and Finn, so it may be easier to follow that way. The native speaker, American, says, okay, how are you doing today? So here we notice the opening sequence. Um, on line two, the non-native speaker says, I'm real bad. I was so, we, we've been so angry with my wife because we have he and his wife, he means to say, it's a little bit idiomatic, um, uh, like transfer from, uh, from his native language. Uh, so angry with my wife, not angry to the wife, but the wife and he had been angry because we have problems with the computer. What is striking about this answer? This is a business conversation between people who know each other, but they are not like buddies. It's off the topic, right? It's too long, too long for the American. Last time we looked at that American conversation. Hi, Red. Hi, Larry. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Directly to the business. So here the American is expecting that uh, he'll get back, uh, fine, thanks, how are you? But he gets this, I'm real bad. Or, and, and then the, the description of why, uh, why bad, because there has been this problem with the computer. And because the American doesn't know what to do with this kind of a response, unexpected response, to something that was supposed to be just a routine greeting part of the business telephone conversation opening episode, he just laughs because he doesn't know what to say. So he's just like, ha, ha, ha. The non-native speaker on line six uh, continues, and this is, by the way, important that you put those line numbers to your transcription so that in your analysis you can refer to the line numbers so that it's easier to follow. Okay, line six, the Finn says, you don't believe how, how these people, how they are, or they are sending us to four different companies. I never buy an EB, IBM anymore. And uh, again, so he is elaborating. What is the episode that he is in? the non-native speaker, the Finnish speaker, the native speaker of Finnish. What, what episode is he in now? Is this so, so he would be in that non-topical conversation that for the Finnish business conversations is almost necessary. So he's doing the non-topical before getting to the real business. This is not the business. This has nothing to do with what they were <coughs> talking about because they were talking about uh, logistics of, uh, of uh, transportation. So <coughs> he continues uh, to elaborate. Uh, he is answering the question, how are you doing today? Which was not a question, it was a greeting by the American. So again, on line nine, the uh, American speaker doesn't know how to react to this. So he says, oh really? Kind of like to buy more time, to kind of like ponder how am I gonna get to the business if this person is just telling about, about a computer problem with us, which has nothing to do with what we were supposed to be talking about. And the non-native speaker says, yeah, and uh, the native speaker on line 11 says, you have a big problem with your IBM. Well, duh, that's what the, the, the non-native speaker, the Finn had just been saying, that he has a big problem with his computer. And so he's just re repeating it because he doesn't know how to react. What is expected 
in this non-topical, in the Finnish Finnish business conversation is this kind of like commiseration. If someone says something, oh, I'm re- I'm real bad. This is ha- this is what happened, and the other person would be kind of like, well, I have had problems with my computer also, and maybe provide a solution or whatever. But the the problem is that that both of these people's expectations are not met because the American is expecting to be going swiftly to business while the Finn is expecting on his initiated non-topical sequence to be elaborated on by the American, to be joined. Let's talk about this a little bit and then we can move on to business. So uh, on line 12, the, the Finn says, yes, um, if, uh, that's what I just told you. I have a big problem with your, with my IBM. And the non-native speaker doesn't know what to do, so what to say, how to deal with this long non-topical. And he just says, how funny. Well, this is not funny from the other person's point of view, but you know, what else do you say if you don't know how to react? How funny, how interesting. <laughs> so. So, uh, line 14, um, the non-native speaker is not done with the non-topical sequence, so he continues. It, It hasn't been long enough from his cultural point of view, so he continues. Yeah, and I think that it is basically that the first guy who sold it to us, he put the wrong serial number in the guarantee papers. Uh... So, too much information for the American, so he just says on line 17, oh, the non-native speaker is still not getting it, that the native speaker does not want to elaborate on this non-topical. So he, and, and for him, it needs to be a little bit longer. We're not done yet, we're not ready, we're not matured, matured re, ripe enough in this discourse in order to start. The, uh, the business episode. So he says lines 18 through uh, 21. We have a warranty on it, but the serial number is different. He has made a um, smash. It's a little bit his uh, interlanguage here. It's not quite, you know, idiomatic to us, and it's going to cost almost two thousand dollars. That that fact that he sometimes may use a different, you know, pronunciation, the grammar is not idiomatic, and so on. That is not a problem for this conversation. People hear a lot of non-native speakers, and we tend to accept an awful lot. But if there's a problem in discourse organization, that is a bigger problem. So. So uh, the non-native speaker says, oh no, now that, you know, dollars are mentioned, he kind of wakes up and says, oh no. So the native, non-native speaker, the Finn says, so I'm pissed. And the American uh, agrees to this part of it and says, yeah, I, I would be very pissed too, ha ha. So he is now giving something back that he would be also annoyed by this situation or pissed to use uh, the, the original word. And, uh, and the non-native speaker says, yeah. So if you, look at, uh, if you look at line 24, you see a couple of uh, things from the transcription point of view. There's repetition. This happens in natural conversation. We repeat things, and people usually, they just kind of like don't even pay attention to that the person said something several times in the beginning, like I, say, I tend to say, so, and, so, you know, people kind of gloss over that because that's not the focus. We know that they are marking that, okay, she's soon getting to the, to the, uh, to the main uh, content of the sentence. But here, line four, one, the, uh, the American says, I, I would be very pissed too, ha ha, so the, the, uh, Repetition is uh, re- repeated in the transcription. It's uh, it's recorded in the transcription. Pay attention to it because sometimes we just naturally we just gloss over them. But if someone has like a, this is called a false start or repetition in the beginning, so mark everything down. Uh, 
Uh, but there at the end of lines 24 and 25, when the American says, ha, uh, the, the Finn says, yeah, at the same time. This, uh, this uh, marks overlapping speech. So, uh, so make, make note of all those uh, when you do your detailed transcription. The native speaker then says, uh, he really wants to get to the business and he wants to finish uh, this non-topical sequence and get to the business uh, episode. So he says, oh, what an awful thing. That's, that's a lot of cars you have to sell. Hint, hint. We're supposed to be talking about shipping cars uh, that have been, you know, sold and that now need to be shipped. And the non-native speaker says, yeah, I have to ship a many, many, many cars. So he is not still quite ready to get to the topic, which is hinted upon quite uh, clearly uh, on line 27. It's a lot of cars you have to sell. Uh, yeah, I have to ship a many, many, many cars. Um, line 29, the American tries again. Uh, that's a lot of cars for a lousy computer. The non-native speaker, the Finn says, agrees, yes, and laughs. The native speaker is like, this man is not getting it. And uh, now th 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 there's this clear disconnect there. Uh, same for me too, hint, hint, I have to make some money as well. And the non-native speaker, the Finn says, oh, um, because he's still in his non-topical episode. And then the native speaker, the, f the, the American, has to be extremely explicit, and he is on line 33, saying, so I'm returning your call regarding a rate that you want. And uh, then they begin talking about the business. But you see all these kind of like missed opportunities on both sides. The Finn wants a little bit more uh, from the American because it's, it's an unhealthy conversation if just one person is talking. So here we notice that, that the, the the discourse turns by the non-native speaker, the Finn, a lot or longer. The American is just saying, um, like, you know, how funny, or he laughs, and, and uh, so on. Uh, but uh, there's this discrepancy uh, and a tangible uh, kind of like uncomfort on both sides because both are like doggedly following their own discourse patterns, but because they are different, they end up with this clash. And this is also how stereotypes are created, that people come with, uh, come to, to a conversation with another person who is coming from a different discourse background. The cultural differences can sometimes be, they're usually subtle, but even this is, this is subtle difference. But it leads to this, this odd kind of like, I don't know how, how to describe it, like a limping conversation that you can see that people are not on the same page. And then they finally get to the business episode, and then everything is everything is fine, and they they their expectations are met there. And it's just this opening because the Finn uh, interprets the "How are you?" as the beginning of a non-topical, and treats it as such. And then the American doesn't know what to do, how to politely say, hey, we need to get in my culture. We get to the business immediately after the how are you sequence. So here, uh, and I'll post this, I have, this is exactly the same, same thing. But what I've done here, as I, as I mentioned to you, in the transcription uh, guidelines, do a, a, a transcription which has basically only one verb per line. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit easier for you to, to analyze, to see what's going on if it's, it, so it's, it becomes longer, but, uh, but it makes it a little bit clearer 
uh, what is what is happening in the in the discourse. So uh, so this is just the same thing. This comes from from the uh, published version of it. I have another example about discourse uh, expectations not having been met, and this comes from some of my early work as well. I was really into this kind of thing because I was living it. I, I'm noticing, I mean, I it was an English major. I uh, had been teaching English, so certainly my English was clear enough, error-free enough for me to get along. This is this was in California when I was in grad school, and uh, and uh, it, there was no big problem with the my my linguistic competence in English, but the communicative competence was sometimes a problem. And remember we talked about communicative competence, we also need that. This was um, Del Heinz's term, uh, whereas uh, linguistic competence is a, is a notion that comes from Noam Chomsky. So we know how to pronounce words, we know how to build words, we know how to build sentences and phrases, we understand the meanings of words. So it's phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, and semantics. We, can, we have linguistic competence in those areas. But in addition to that, we also need uh, communicative competence. How in a situation, in a particular speech event, uh, which come of different kinds, uh, and we need to get something done, uh, how to behave linguistically in that situation. And let's look at uh, number two first here. Uh, here we have a telephone conversation, and uh, the, the first part, the, uh, it, which is called uh, the summons, is that the phone rings. So this, is, this comes from Finnish. I, I, that's where I come from. That's where I grew up. Uh, acquired my communicative competence about telephone conversations. And one key feature of a Finnish telephone conversation is that you always say your name, even though you know the person would recognize your voice or what have you, but you still have to say your name in order to be polite. Uh, even if your name doesn't matter, you still say your name. It's just kind of like part of, part of the uh, phone etiquette, which is culture dependent. So communicative competence is always culture dependent. So the phone rings and this person whose name is uh, Sirka Kotolainen uh, answers the phone and says her, her full name, first name and last name. And uh, the, then uh, the person who calls is Perti Huomenta. This is Perti, good morning. <laughs> and uh, just first name because these, are, these people know each other. Um, and there was no uh, phone ID on the on the phone and that is an interesting uh, feature that that may have affected how how people uh, how people behave I uh, have to be looking for you know some some really recent research about how um, how this may have changed how Finns answer the phone because you know somebody calls yourself you can say, oh, it's mom calling, oh, it's my friend calling. So you don't have to say the names because it's right there in front of your face or next to your ear. So, uh, so then uh, the, the other person says, good morning, woman. So um, then I come from this background. I'm in California. Uh, I'm fluent in English, but I'm not fluent in my communicative competence is kind of limping. It's, uh, I kept running into these situations. That's why I became interested in that. So I, one evening I had to feed my family and I didn't have time to cook. So I just decided, oh, we'll just call a pizza. It was kind of late. So I called to this place and this is a different, uh, a different uh, name. Uh, so uh, I call um, the pizza deliverer answers double or nothing pizza with the question intonation, rising intonation. 
double or nothing pizza. What is his expectation? What is what is he? Uh, what does he? What does he, he expect to hear from me? The order. Yeah, the order. What kind of pizza, right? So uh, he's not expecting to hear my name because it's totally irrelevant for him. And yet, I come from this culture where saying your name is obligatory. I mean, little Finnish, Finnish kids practicing kindergarten uh, with their little plastic phones. This is my, uh, hello, this is, this is uh, Becca. And uh, so you, you learn that. It's kind of like part of your soul that you say your name when you, when you call someone. So I say, I follow my gut instinct. And I say, this is Helena Halmari, hi. On line three, he's totally thrown off by this innocent introduction by mine, because it's not innocent from his point of view. He says, what was your name? He thinks that if I say my name, it is somehow connected to something that has happened before. He needs to know my name if I say my name. Because who, in her right mind, would say her name if it doesn't mean anything to the pizza, bu pizza buying exchange? And so he's, what's your name? No, this, this breaks my, if I broke his, uh, his discourse expectations on line two by saying my name, he's saying, what was your name? breaks my expectations and I become a little bit annoyed. I have a family to feed, I am hungry myself, I need my pizza, I don't have to explain why I say my name. So um, so I, I repeated, uh, Helen Halmary, what was, what was your name? Helen Halmary. And I'm annoyed now. Now, uh, if you become annoyed, you probably have seen that it can kind of spread in the conversation. So in this case, the pizza deliverer gets annoyed because I am annoyed. And the conversation is, which was supposed to be a routine exchange, tell me what kind of pizza you want. And so he's annoyed and he says, why do I want to know your name? And of course, that makes me even more annoyed. And I say, well, because it's polite to introduce yourself. In this culture, not. It's not part of what is considered polite. And so we, so this whole conversation from the from from line two, because of my incompetence in communicative, uh, communicative competence in telephone conversations, it went. It, it was derailed. Yes. Like, like with that conversation, it does, they do get your name, but it happened in the wrong order. Because like, like at work I would go, uh, thank you for calling all these people. This is Jerry, I'm gonna help you. And then they tell me what they need. And yes. then I'll be like, can I get your name? And then that's when they're Yes, like, so it comes then later on, can I get your name? And like, you know, you go to Starbucks and they, what is your name? But there's a reason for it, why? Because you know the right person needs to get the right, <laughs> right uh, item, uh, service item. So yeah, it, it is true. But that that's so that is those are such subtle differences. Yes. I feel like it was it was like I understand that like the expectations were like not met, but I feel like it's more along the lines of like just bad customer service because like even if his expectation wasn't met, he could have like after the. I know, I know, I know, uh, and that's why I was, that's why I was annoyed, because you know, the customer is always right, quote, unquote, unquote. but uh, he had had a long day, I had had a long day, he had had a long day, and these are the contextual factors that sometimes come into, into play, um, something bad may have happened to him, or what have you, and all that was bad in my life at that point was that I was hungry and the family needed to be fed. So we both came from to this into this conversation, maybe just wanting to not run into any 
any problems. So, uh, so this ended, uh, ended kind of badly. Um, uh, I, 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 I gave him a little lecture that, you know, you, you're, supposed to, you're supposed to say your name when you call someone, and he's just like, no. <laughs> and I ended up hanging, on, hanging up on him and ordering my pizza from another place. So that was the consequence. But I felt so bad, I started thinking, well, he must have had a really long day and something, you know, I, I have no right to be lecturing to him about the <laughs> intercultural differences in telephone conversations, <laughs> you know, which is kind of like, you know, my thing. And, uh, and you know, I'm sinning myself. I should, should have known, but I, 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 you know, you kind of like fall back to your very innermost cultural patterns and um, and I, I then I start thinking oh this is really bad that here I am as a non a clearly a non-native speaker and I am giving an example of a badly behaving non-native speaker here myself uh, and and that's kind of like you know I'm, I'm a bad representative of all the immigrants in this com a com country because I'm behaving this way. So what I did after I had ordered my pizza from elsewhere, I, um, I called back to him and I said, uh, I spoke with you a little bit before and I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I was uh, making a mistake. And uh, so, so it was kind of like, oh, okay. And, and he was, oh, okay, it's, it's fine. And so we kind of made up. But anyway, this is what may happen when, you know, the expectations are not, are not met. And uh, that's, that's uh, do you have anything you would, you would like to add here? Oh, let's look at, let's look at uh, some of the handouts that I, that I gave, uh, because I did want to talk about that we still have like 10 minutes. Good. So um, I did want to talk about, uh, let me finish this adjacency pair first. I, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, do you have any, any comments, any... It has anything like that happened to you that may be like culturally based, even though in this country? I just like in the in the last one did too, where he he laughed at the customer instead yeah. of like because usually when they tell you that they've been having a problem with it, you go, um, sorry, I'm sorry to hear about that, sir. How uh, what? I'm not going to go as far and say that, you know, wars can be avoided uh, if we understand each other's 
uh, discourse patterns better, but, um, but definitely we can minimize negative stereotyping. Deborah Tannen, who, whom I've mentioned earlier, um, has, has written these uh, interesting, interesting books about discourse and you know, sociolinguistic point of view about talking, how things may go wrong. So, so some of her titles are quite telling. That's not what I meant. <laughs> is one of her books, and another one is You Just Don't Understand, and um, Talking from Nine to Five, and so these are her early books, and they are like, you know, if you, if you want to read something, you know, when the semester is over and you have, you have time, and if you're interested in these things, uh, she writes extremely, like, nicely and points out, brings a lot of examples from everyday life and, uh, and, and it, they are like popularly written books so it's not like, I mean she's an academic, they, these are academic topics but she writes about them so that anyone can understand uh, what is going on without having taken a course in sociolinguistics. So um, she uh, begins her one of her books by saying that my husband and I came from totally different uh, linguistic backgrounds culturally, even though both were Americans, uh, native, native speakers of English, and yet she says they ended up in a divorce, and she said the divorce may or may not have been avoided, but at least we would have understood a lot more about each other and not been like, you know, constantly annoyed by what someone says and, and so on. Uh, if we had thought about it, that it's, it's based on different discourse patterns, cultural different, uh, culturally different discourse patterns, even though they both were Americans. So, um, Anyway, um, okay, so what I want, wanted to show you here, there's a little excerpt from D.H. Lawrence's New Eve and Old Adam. And this is how a fiction writer, a novelist, uh, depicts conversation. So if you just look at that, uh, just take a minute and, and look over that, uh, that uh, one page excerpt so just just look at how do how do they depict of how people say things quotations yes so um, you have to quotations you put it in quotations exactly and then you very often still have to say he said to the maid so explain who the participants are and, and indicate that this is what the person said, even though the quotation marks would do that same, same thing, but it's, it kind of is embedded into this uh, narrative there. Yes. Yes, exactly. So the italics is shown emphasis. And we will show those kinds of things in the transcription as well. So you would put it in capitals. There might have been a Richards. Um, what do you care? And uh, the tone of voice here is indicated by what? What did you care? Not by a question mark. It's not a question, really. It's like, you didn't care with the exclamation mark. So these indicate tone of voice. Um, in that case, you'd, you'd have been a liar and worse, so why should I care about you then? You don't care about me, she said sullenly. So you indicate with adverbs, sullenly, and again in italics, the emphasized word. You don't care about me. You say what you please. He answered, and we can kind of, kind of hear that 
he said it in a very careless kind of a manner. You say what you please. And then w the, the silence is also indicated in fiction by specifically say, saying she was silent for some time. Now, when you do the transcription, you will count the seconds <laughs> so and put them in, in parentheses. So if, it ju if it's just a very short pause, just the period here, and all these conventions are on that, uh, on that sheet that I already said, uh, said a, a couple of points indicate twice as long a pause, but not quite a second. If it's a second long, you put it in, in, uh, in um, brackets, uh, sometimes a three second long pause, um, which is definitely a significant pause. It sends some kind of message, something's going on. Either the person didn't understand, didn't hear, didn't know what to say next, or disagrees. We, we're sometimes silent when we disagree. Someone says, makes a comment and we just don't, agree, so then we're just like silent. And silent is sometimes very, don't they say pregnant silent? It's very uh, tangible and, and so on. So uh, I just wanted to um, show this, uh, the last, uh, and he said slowly forcing the words out, I shall stay at the Aquila Nera at Milan, you know my address. And um, it, so if, if something is said really slowly, you can you know, put those pauses in between, or there are ways of indicating those if you do a very close course transcription. So uh, the, the one uh, on, on that same page, uh, the example transcript then comes from Tannen, Deborah Tannen, uh, from her early work. This was her dissertation, which uh, she used, uh, where, where she used a um, uh, Thanksgiving dinner conversation to write her entire dissertation. So uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in a dinner table conversation um, that you can then uh, then look at and do a really long analysis like a dissertation. So, um, so Steve starts, uh, remember where WINS used to be, WINS in capitals because that's emphasized, that's some kind of a store. Deborah says, no, Steve continues without any audible pause, so you've got the latching there. No. Then they built a big, huge sky, sky, uh, scraper there, and it's rising intonation because Steve wasn't sure if that's what had happened in that place. And Deborah says, no, where was that? And uh, if you look at page seven, it gets complicated, even though this is a very simple conversation itself, but how it's built and structured with these overlaps. So when uh, Steve is saying, that building shaped like that, and shows with his hands. Now, if someone does something like showing with his hands, uh, is offering something, uh, or taking a drink, for instance, or something, indicate that also. And those, that would go in, in brackets as well. So shows with his hands. But when uh, Steve is saying, that building shaped like that, um, Peter is talking simultaneously, and he starts talking when, when Steve says building, then Peter starts talking. Did I give you too much? Now, this did I give you too much uh, would be totally out of context, like, you know, uh, against uh, Grice's maxim of relevance in this conversation, unless the transcriber put an explanation in brackets that he is serving turkey. Peter is serving Turkey. And then there's a third person speaking at the same time, that's Deborah. Um, when, uh, when Steve is finishing the word building, in, and Peter is saying, I give you too much, Deborah is saying simultaneously by Columbus circuit. 
So this is already with with this many people. You've got three here, and it becomes you know three people talking simultaneously. They are not quarreling. They are all contributing to the situation. Uh, Peter by serving Turkey and Stephen and Deborah were talking about the same thing. So it's a coherent exchange, but it's very difficult. You have to listen to. Uh, the same same phrase several several times to get what other people you know with, with, with these overlapping voices are saying. Okay, so there are a couple more examples from these are actually uh, student uh, exchanges. Some of them are kind of funny, some of them are kind of tragic, but they are here just to give you an example of different kinds. These are not like perfect transcriptions, so I wouldn't probably give 10 out of 10 points uh, for all of them, but, but they give you an idea of the kinds of things, how you can mark these things. And, and you'll find under advanced symbols, uh, in today's uh, computers, you find these symbols from which you can build the latchings and so on. But don't spend too much time on that. Uh, uh, just somehow indicate the latching if, uh, if, you, if you can't find those symbols. Like you see here, um, they have been handwritten in some of the transcripts. Okay, and enjoy the assignment. Bye.